Fantastic. My name is Chris. I'm going to be with you guys, Lord willing, for the next uh, few weeks. And we're going to be looking at running, running away from home. Quick question. How many of y'all ever, in the, the time you've been living, have ever ran away from home? Let me see your hands. Oh, yes. All righty then. We're talking to the right crowd. In fact, let me just say this. When we're children, it's all about running from something. It's not about running to something. Right? I mean, I have three children of my own. I have a 13 year old boy, an eight year old boy, and a five year old boy. And people ask, why do you have so many children? It's because my wife can't keep her hands off of me. I'm just saying. All right? <clears throat> and uh, uh, those three boys, I love them, but sometimes I realize that I can exasperate them. And they want to leave home. And I remember being a kid <clears throat> and wanting to leave home. It's all about leaving from something, but you don't really think it out. Where are you going? I don't know. You're going to the end of the driveway, going to the tree house, going to the gully where I'm from. There's a lot of gullies. Um, so uh, it's all about running from something, not to something. Now, when we get older, um, when we're a teenager, uh, it's not really about running from something. It's usually about running to something, to a relationship, to an addiction, to a party, to whatever. Um, and in between that time, we may spend a couple of uh, happy days at home. Here's the thing, though. All of us, we've had this tendency to run away from home. Don't, don't put up your hands. How many of you, if, if we had to just talk about this, just you and I on a couch, how many of you ever ran away from God? Because here's the thing. I believe the Bible teaches us very clearly that none of us run to God. We run away from God. In fact, Romans 5.8 says this, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. If I could paraphrase that this way, this would be the message. <clears throat> while we were running, God ran to us. All of us have a tendency to run from God, and that usually happens when we get our driver's license or when we graduate from high school, when we go to college. We usually have a tendency to run from God because we think of religion and God and church as just old and fuddy-duddy and traditionalism, and that's just what my parents believed, right? I mean, I, I, we've all been there. All of us have run away from God, and we start thinking you know, that, we, we, that God is a God of no and that God, we, we want to have fun, we want to have a great time, but we know God would say, no, 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 no. And you need to know this. One of the things we're going to be looking at over the next few weeks, God is, a, is not a God of no. God is a God of life. He is a God of hope. He is a God of peace. If you think, and if you're here, if this is your first time like ever in church, or if this is your first time back in the church, <clears throat> you need to know this, that God loves you and has a plan for your life. He's not a God of just no. He's a God of now and showing you what's next. So it's my prayer as we go through this series, White Flag, we're going to be seeing how we all have this tendency to run from God. We kind of put God in the rearview mirror, and we kind of drive away. And we're afraid that if we surrender to God, we pray, we, we're afraid if we pray those white flag prayers of surrender, that we're going to miss out on something, miss out on something good. So we leave God on the back burner, on the rearview mirror. And it may just not just be that many of us just leave God just like we become agnostic or atheist. We, some of us just leave God in one area of our life. In fact, if you're here today, this is probably who I'm talking to because I'm talking to me. We, we, we come to church, we, we put a Lincoln in the offering plate, we, we're not going crazy, it ain't going to be no Benjamins, right? We just put Lincolns uh, or Washingtons, right? But we, we throw a little bit of cash in the offering plate and we're here and we're doing our time on Sunday, but Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, we do other things and we have other areas in our, we, we compartmentalize. We compartmentalize and say, you know, all right, this is a God thing here on Sunday, but in this one area, God, you don't tell me what to do. In, in how I relate to my children, you don't tell me what. In, in how I relate to my spouse, you don't tell me what to do. In what I look on on my computer, you don't tell me what to do. And we have these little sections in our life that we still pray to God. We still believe in God. But there's this one section, it's like God hands off. This one area that we run from him, and we go back to him, and we pray, and we talk, and we're good. We're great, except for this one pocket that we're running from God. And some of your scenarios of running from God maybe looks like this. 
Guys, you know the type of girl that God wants you to date, but she's hot. All right, she is beautiful. She's right, and you're you're thinking it's it's easier for me to tell her about Jesus and for her to become a Christian than for you to make somebody look good, right? So you're thinking you found a loophole, right? You found a loophole, and everything's good to go. Or ladies, you I mean he looks good on on those on those skinny jeans. There's a reason why I don't wear skinny jeans. I'm just saying, <laughs> it wasn't that funny. I'm joking. I, <clears throat> There's a reason, I mean, here's the thing, and, and, and he drives one of those, and not all guys can drive one of those, so you'll marry him and you'll change him. Anybody tried doing that one? Dear Jesus, you can't change anybody. Half the time, I can't change me, right? But it doesn't, it works, or you know what? We love God, we pray to God, but this one area of our finances we just keep on racking up debt, and we know what God has to say about finances. And we, we, we even think if we ever brought this to God, he would probably say some stuff, and he would want us to do something with our money, but it wouldn't be what we're doing right now. And we, we, kinda, we love God, we follow God, but this one area of our checkbook, we say, hands off. For others of you, we, we pray, we still ask God, but we think we know what's better in our life in this one area. And we tell God, hands off. And we have a tendency to run. Some of you ran away from God because you confused the church with God. In fact, the church that I pastor, onechurch.tv, uh, we have a lot of people this way. Because our mission is, our goal is to reach the unchurched and the dechurched. And the reason why people don't go to church in the South, you want to know why? Because they've been to church in the South. You know what I'm saying? So they grew up as a kid, and I remember, no lie, I'm not going to name any church names here, but I remember going in a church when I was just a little bitty kid, and the deacons got up and started literally like throwing fists and start dro- you know, dropping four-letter words. And, uh, and that's when my parents said, you know, we're not going to be a part of this church anymore. And they kind of walked off and walked away. And I, that's how, that was my, kind of my first introduction to the church. And some of you, you know how that is, because your mom or your dad, wasn't allowed to do, and you fill in the blank. They weren't allowed to serve in this area. They went, and they were shunned, and you confused church with God, and you said, you know, if God's people are that mean, then that must be that God is that mean. But we're going to see that he's not. Some of us, we just confuse life with God. That's Philip Yancey quote. We confuse life with God. I was supposed to be with you guys back in July. I didn't make it. Let me tell you the reason why. The Saturday before Father's Day, I was riding my bike with my 13-year-old, and I had a bike accident. In fact, I don't know if you can see my scar. It's pretty nasty. Um, and uh, it's the first time I ever broke any bones or anything like that. And, you know, some people say, you can't ride a bike. And, I, you know, I couldn't preach for eight weeks, and I started getting nervous because I'd not preach for eight weeks. And my family pastor says, don't worry, it's just like riding a bike. And that's when I wanted to punch him. So, um in Jesus' name, of course. Um, but here's the thing. I, I, I don't know why that happened. I, I ended up hitting this bump, and my, my front tire separated from my handlebars, and I flipped over. And, you know, I, I can have a tendency to blame God for that and, and ask the question that all of us ask, why? Here's one of the things I've learned in, the, in that eight weeks when I felt like I was just shelved. Those eight weeks, I realized this, that why questions always get us stuck. We all ask why questions and we ask the wrong question. It's not that why did this happen. Here's a better question to ask. Who? Who are you going to trust in when things get rough? Because here's what I know. Some of you, life is great in here. Life is grand. It's wonderful. Just buckle up. It's coming. Because things are going to get rough. Some of you, you're here and, you know, the, the housing market's tanked. You know, your 401k is 401 gone. And you are just struggling. And we, and we ask the why question. A better question is who? Who are you going to trust in? We confuse life with God. And we walk away from God because we think life has handed us lemons. And we must think that God has handed us lemons. What we're going to be looking at today is the book of Jonah. <clears throat> the book of Jonah. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and start turning to the book of Jonah. And my, my biggest thing is good luck finding it. Um, I would encourage you that if, you, if you've gotten to the prophet Malachi, the Italian prophet, you've went too far. All right, so uh, the, uh, let's just go ahead and turn to our table of contents because about the time you find Jonah, 
I'm going to be saying amen, and we're going to be done, okay? So um, uh, Jonah, uh, if you have your uh, web-enabled phone, you can download version and follow the live events, and you can just type in Jonah. But we're going to be looking at Jonah. Now, quick question. When I say the word Jonah, the name Jonah, what do you normally just immediately think about? Absolutely right. The whale. That's the first thing that comes to my mind. You know what's interesting about the book of Jonah? The book of Jonah doesn't even say it was a whale. It says it was a great fish, right? Here's what's so amazing. I feel like when, the, when, we, when we open up and crack this Bible, uh, this book called Jonah, we get so enamored with a great fish that we've missed a great God. Because this story is not about a whale or a great fish. It is about God. It, he starts in the front, he ends in the back, and he's all in between. In fact, let me prove it to you. Jonah chapter 1, verse 1, it says this. The word of God came to Jonah. And then in Jonah chapter 1, verse 4, and God hurled a great wind on the sea. Jonah 1, 17, and God appointed a great fish. Jonah 2, 10, then God commanded the fish. Jonah 4, 6, so God appointed a plant. Jonah 4, 7, but God appointed a worm. Jonah 4, 8, then God appointed a scorching east when it starts with God, it ends with God, and guess who's all in between? God. His fingerprints are all over this. It's amazing to me that everything in the book of Jonah obeys God except people. Seriously. I mean, God says to the storm, hey, storm, I want you to kind of whip up some wind. And the storm says, okay, right? And then God tells this whale, I want you to swallow Jonah. By the way, you're going to get some indigestion. And the, jo- and the whale says, bleh, bleh, bleh. okay, Jonah, uh, God tells, uh, I want you to, uh, you know, have this plant grow up. And the plant says, okay. And then God tells this worm, I want you to eat the plant. And the worm says, okay, right? And you have all of this stuff obeying God except the preacher. Isn't that something? Some of you, you're like, see, preachers. And there you go. You're welcome to throw some stones at us because many times we're the last to, to kind of the last to know. And let me just say, it's not just preachers, it's just people. People, we have this tendency to, God gives us, and, here, and here's some doctrine here. God gives us a choice whether or not we obey him. God gives us a choice. Some people call this free will, not free willy, but free will. And what this means is that God won't force us to listen and obey. God won't force us. He could, but he's so loving enough that he gives us the choice that we can choose right or we can choose wrong. We can choose death or we can choose life. And he gives us the choice. Now, let's get some context before we start diving into the story. All right, The context is 750 B.C. and Jonah, Jonah is the prophet. The prophet is just a guy that speaks for God. Our big idea today, I usually preach in like one point big ideas. It's kind of broken up into into two parts. And the first part is this. Our big idea, God lets us run from him. Let's all say that. God lets us run from him. If you're a Christian here today, God will let you run or walk away from him. He will. He loves you. He gives you that choice. If you don't believe the Bible, if you're not a Christ follower today, you need to hear me. God will let you walk or run away from him. He gives us that choice. That is the first part of our big idea. Now look at what it says in Jonah chapter 1 verse 1. It says this, the Lord gave this message to Jonah, son of Amittai. The first thing, and this is in your notes, first thing is this, like Jonah, the word of the Lord comes to us as well, and it's through the Bible. The word of the Lord comes to us as well through the Bible. Good news is, is that the word of the Lord will come to you today. And it's not my words. It's not because I'm any of that. It's because we are reading God's word. Let me tell you, (coughs) excuse me. Our God is a God who loves to speak. He loves to communicate with his people. Now, let me tell you how he's communicated in times past. He's communicated with dreams He's communicated with visions. He's communicated in an audible voice. He's communicated in burning bushes. Um, he has uh, communicated uh, with, uh, through prophets and people. He's communicated through miracles. But John chapter 1, verse 1 says this, And the word, 
The word was with God, the word was God, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That when, G- when God spoke Jesus, Jesus has always been, he is, he's never not existed. <clears throat> but when he showed up, God's word was written, and we don't have to worry about dreams or horoscopes or anything like that because I lead a jacked up church. Okay, our, the majority of our church is military, 75% is military, and uh, uh, the majority of them have never been to church before, so they are like clueless, and I love our people. I love our people, because um, I grew up in church, and I know all the stories, and they don't know them. Um, and I've had people come up to me and say, you know, pastor, and they usually don't call me pastor, they usually say Chris, or, and they try not to say four-letter words at church, um, and they're all tatted up and pierced up, and you know, that's the reason I liked hanging out with David. I'm kind of like the PC and David was the Mac. You know what I mean? I, I, love, I mean, I, he, he made me look cool. So I'm just saying. Anyway, uh, but I'll tell you, one of the things I love about our people, so they'll come to me and say, uh, Chris, you know, I want to understand God's will, and this is what my horoscope said. <laughs> okay? You know, of course, I'm thinking, you know, you're looking at the wrong thing. Or this is what, I, I, seriously, I've had people come to say, you know, um, Chris, I got this dream last night. It had about this pink bunny, and he was beating a bass drum, and he was going over a rainbow bridge. You know, what do you think God's trying to tell me? And I said, I think God's trying to tell you you need to stop doing drugs. Let me tell you, can God use all of those mediums to communicate with us? Yes. But what he chooses to communicate his, to, to, to us today is through his word. If you want to know what God has for your life, you have to open up the book and read his word. Let me tell you how God describes his word. It is described as living, as active, as sharper than any two-edged sword. It's like a scalpel to our souls. His word pierces us. His word, truth, is living. It transforms us by the renewing of our minds. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 says that. Verse 2. God speaks to something, and let me tell you this. God will never speak something to you directly that that contradicts his word. You hear what I'm saying? Let me tell you another thing. This is huge. That delayed obedience is disobedience. Delayed obedience is disobedience. For some of you, you're like, okay, I I understand it. I understand God, but I'm going to do this later. And God says, no, 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 no. Delayed obedience is disobedience. And don't raise your hands for this, but, but parents who parent this way of the one, the counting method, I'd encourage you not to do that. And let me tell you why. Because when you start, okay, hey, little Sally, I know you're running towards the street. You need to come back one, two, two and a half, splat, right? There are some things, what you're, what you're doing is you're training your children that you don't have to listen the first time. That you don't have to listen even the second time. When you start getting into fractions, two, two and three quarters, you know, what's the point, right? You see, God doesn't do the counting method. There are some things that are just too important that we can't. Delayed obedience is disobedience. That's huge. Now, huge. God gives us a choice to run. Look at verse 1 and now verse 2. The Lord gave this message to Jonah, son of Amittai. Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh. Uh, announce my judgment against it because I've seen how wicked its people are. Nineveh. How many of y'all have ever heard of this little country? It's called Iraq. Anyone? In fact, of the military folks in our church, I end up asking the question, how many of y'all have ever been to Mosul? And almost everybody raised their hands because Mosul is modern-day Nineveh. That is the ruins of Nineveh. Assyrian Babylon is exactly where Iraq is today. Now, very, very important. That's huge because this is not some made-up fairy tale. This is truth. This is history. This is God's word. Now, God told Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh, and I want you to give him a second chance. I want you to preach something. And Jonah says, no. Now, why did he say no? Well, we're going to be looking at a couple of things. The first reason why he said no is Jonah had some friends by the name of Amos and Hosea who were in northern Israel. He were hanging out with. I'm sure they got together and they uh, played uh, Texas Hold'em. And God was telling these other two dudes, Amos and Hosea, I want you to preach to Israel and I want you to tell them that if they don't shape up and ship out, the Syrians are going to come in and clean their clocks. And then... God tells Jonah, I want you to go to Assyria 
and I want you to tell these people that have no worldview, doesn't have your worldview, doesn't have your values, I mean, they don't know Yahweh, they don't know God, you go tell them that God's getting ready to turn off the lights on them. And he's more patriot than preacher. And he says, no, I'm not going to do that. Because if I do that and they get, you know, they get right, then they're going to be around to judge my friends and my family. That's very, very interesting. But here's another thing I like about this. God sends Jonah to Nineveh. Now, quick question for those who like, have, have some history about the Bible. Was the people of Nineveh God's people? I mean, were they God's chosen people? No. Who was God's chosen people? The Israelites, the Jews, the Hebrews, exactly right. And th I love this because God is for, he is interested in all people, not just church people. You hear what I'm saying? You see, if you kind of grew up in church and you kind of hang out at church for long enough, it's church people who pay the bills. It's church people many times who complain it's church people, we start becoming inward focused and thinking it's all about us, and it's not. In fact, Jesus said it like this. Jesus says in Luke 19.10, I came to seek and to save that which was lost. Thank you very much. You see, that was Jesus' mission, and many times our mission is to keep the found happy. Come on now, I'm preaching this morning, somebody ain't with me. I'm just saying is to keep the found happy. And if you, if you keep the found happy, then everything's good. But let me tell you, God cares for all. All people, all people. I love Christmas. In fact, I have one 160 gig iPod. I I'm not making this stuff up. 160 gig iPod that has nothing but Christmas songs on it. I have 12,000 Christmas songs. I have a problem. Anybody want to agree with me? <laughs> Just saying, I do. And it, it got cold this morning. I'm like, uh oh, I'm going to listen to Meliki Liki Maka. <laughs> Just saying. All right, here's the thing. I love when Christmas gets here and, you know, they show the Charlie Brown Christmas and Linus gets up and he does that monologue and he, and he, and he starts quoting Luke chapter 2. I love that. And it says there were shepherds out in the fields watching their flocks by night and behold, an angel of the Lord said to them, I bring you good news for all people. You see, God cares for the Ninevites just like he cares for the Israelites. God cares for people right now who are hungover, who aren't in this building, and that's the reason why we exist. God gets the most glory when people outside start coming in and we start sharing our faith. That's just, that's huge, and it's my passion, all right? All right, it should be our passion because it was Jesus's passion, all right? Anyway, let's keep on going. It says, get up and go to the city of Nineveh, announce my judgment against it because of how wicked they are. Now, let's talk about how wicked they are. These guys, if they were in an Olympic stadium, they would get gold medal every time because they could torture people and keep them alive the longest. I mean, that's how wicked these folks are. I had this big, long paragraph I was going to read to you, but I'm just going to summarize it. They were so evil. They could fillet somebody's skin and keep them alive. They would, after they filleted their skins and while they were alive, they would bury them up to their necks in the sand. And then they would take their tongue and pull out their tongue and pierce their tongue to the ground. And then they would force them to listen to Lady Gaga music. It's horrific. It was painful. All right. Let me just tell you, because of that, how hor horrific it was, um, that... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that jo this, this goes to our second point is this, that you can always find a boat sailing in the wrong direction because God told Jonah, I want you to go to these people. And Jonah says, let me pray about it. No. In Jesus' name, amen, right? He says, I'm not going to do it. And he found a boat sailing in the wrong direction. Look at verse 3, excuse me. But Jonah got up and went to the opposite direction to get away from the Lord. And he went down to the port of Joppa, where he found a, what does it say? Ship leaving for Tarshish. There he bought a ticket, and he went on board, hoping to escape from who? The Lord by sailing to Tarshish. I mean, hear me, you can always find a ship sailing in the wrong direction. When God comes to you and tells you to do something, you can always find an excuse not to do it. When God tells you, I want you to start giving and tithing, we can always say, you know what, now it's just not a good time. Look at the economy. 
Or you know what? When you finally start getting serious about actually starting loving your wife, even though you don't feel it, you know the right thing to do is to keep on doing it and the feelings will come back. That when you start making that commitment, that's when one of your old flames from Facebook will instant message you. Hey, what you doing? Right? You can always find a boat sailing in the wrong direction. What do you do? I want to show you a picture. I want to show you some maps just to show you kind of put out this point. So we're going to put these maps up on the screen. Here we have the Middle East. And God, uh, it, it, the God's prophet Jonah is located in Joppa in Israel. I'll tell you a little bit about Israel. Very small country, about the size of New Jersey. It's 85 miles wide, about 100 miles long. It's very, very small. But God tells Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh. Now, how far was Nineveh? Look at this. Nineveh was 550 miles, 550 miles to the east. Now, that's inconvenient. You, you, you can drive 550 miles in a Volkswagen or in a Kia or in a Lexus. That's right, I put Lexus with those two other brands. I'm just saying. So I, just got, I got me a Kia last week, and I love it. I'm telling you. But I, you can drive 550 in a, in a vehicle in one day. You can. Now, but the thing is, they didn't have automobiles back then, so this is going to be inconvenient. I mean, you can, you can ride a bike, though it's not going to be me riding it. You can ride a bike, and it would take you about a week to go 550 miles. But on camel? <laughs> Talking about your humps hurting, right? Just saying. All right? When uh, That was funnier. Come on now. Uh, or if you're walking, that is inconvenient. So God says to Jonah, go 550 miles to the east. And Jonah says, El Nino, I'm not. And he decides to go to Tarshish. Now, Tarshish, let me just show you. Tarshish is at the end of the known world, all right? This isn't 1492 yet. Columbus hadn't sailed the ocean blue yet, right? The, I mean, God says, I want you to go this way. And he says, no. And he went as far this way as he could. In fact, how far is it? Survey says 2,500 miles, right? 2,500 miles. I mean, he was willing to go 2,500 miles out of God's will than to go 550 miles in God's will. And let me tell you, because he chose his own thing, it says he ended up buying the ticket. Let me tell you, I didn't say this first service, but anytime you choose to go out of God's will, you end up picking up the tab. You hear what I'm saying? You do. So he says he boards a ship, and he gets on a ship, and one commentator says it would have taken him over a year to get to Tarshish. Over a year. And that brings us to the last part of our big idea. God lets us run from him. But when we run, we always run to wrong places. Every time we run from God, we always run to dangerous places. We run to unstable places. We run to wrong places. God gives us the choice to run, but we run to unstable, dangerous places. I mean, everybody who runs from God runs to a dangerous, wrong, unstable place. I mean, you think about it. God, if you're going to run from God, it's like me saying, hey, you know, I'm going to run from God. I'm going to go hand gliding. Uh, I'm going to run from God. I'm going to go base jumping. All right? I'm running from God. I'm going to go scuba diving with great whites in Australia. We always run to God, from God, and we run to the most dangerous, unstable places. That's huge. That's huge. Because some of you, you know exactly what I'm talking about because you ran to an addiction, you deuced out on God, and you said, see ya, and you ran to an addiction. The thrill has now become an addiction, and it started in a social setting, and now you're all alone. And the, you started drinking together at the huge parties, and now you're an alcoholic who drinks alone. You started going to parties to meet women, and now you're on a computer alone. Addictions always go from more community to being lonely. Because let me tell you, anytime you pull a, a, a wildebeest away from the herd, you know what you call that wildebeest? Lunch. Just saying. There's something huge. We run, uh, the dream becomes a nightmare. We run to a debt. We run to a relationship. We get sick and tired, and we run to dangerous places. Let me tell you the reason why as I close. God is truth, 
God is life. God has a plan. He has a purpose. When you cut God out of the picture, what you have left is not life but death. What you have left is not purpose but no purpose. What you have left is not peace but it's cacophony. Anytime you cut God out of the picture, he is the author, he is the giver, he is the sustainer of life and wisdom, you will run towards foolishness. Because there, there's only two options. You're either going to go God's way or you're going to go your way. And the Bible says in the end there is a path that seems right to everyone, to man, but in the end it leads to death. That is the fact we see. And I tell you, some of you are here and you know exactly what I'm talking about because you have been running. In fact, it's just kind of strange that you're even here. Or maybe it's strange that you've kind of downloaded this podcast or you're watching it on, on the computer because you're not a church person. You're, you've been running and running and you've cut God out of the picture. But one of the things that you're realizing is when you take God out of the picture, when you run from God, you go to unstable places. You go to dangerous places. Let me give you a word of advice. This is free. You don't even have to pay it for it. If you're running from God, that's not the time to get married. I'm just saying. I tell you, last, this past January at our church, I was counseling, and this is not a preacher story made up. This is true. I was counseling 25 couples who are in the process of getting divorced. And there's pain there. You don't want to say, I do forever when you're running from God. You don't want to because there's going to be pain. There's going to be hurt. You don't want to make major big decisions when you're running from God because it's always you're going to make the wrong decision every time. That's the reason why you got people in your life. You may call them prophets and maybe a little strange. They're well-meaning friends, and they come to you and say, Chris, listen, it's, I, it's not my business, but I see you're kind of going down this path, and we want, I love you so much. We don't want you to get hurt. And you listen to them, and you listen to all of this stuff, and you agree with them. You know, you're right. It's none of your business. So stay out of it. But here's the thing. What they're trying to do is they're saying, yes, you can run from God, but your running from God is not going to take you to a good place. It's not. You will end up on the side of the road in a ditch. I want to give you two things of homework before next week. The first one is this. Um, we're going to be finishing Jonah chapter 1 next week. So if you would, I want you to bookmark it or whatever. You can get back to it. And I want you to read Jonah chapter 1 this week. Preferably at least once. I'd be great if you could do it three times. So I want you to read Jonah chapter 1 this week. The second thing is this. I'm really excited about this. Because Jonah's story of running is all of our stories. It's my story. It's your story. I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to ask you at the bottom of your U version, if you're using your web-enabled phone, or you can go to the Gathering website and click on the banner, Share My Jonah Story. Because here's what I'm asking you to do. All of us have ran. That's what God's word says. All of us have ran from God. Right now, some of you are in the process of running. Many of you, you have ran and now you're back. And I want you to share your story. You see, you may have went through a painful divorce. You may have went through a bankruptcy. You may have went through whatever that is, whatever that pain is. And maybe one of the reasons God wants you and allowed you to go through that is because he wanted to, for you to share your story with somebody else. I got this good friend, um, good friend of mine. In fact, he's going to be with me here with you guys in the next couple of weeks. And um, he had an affair about 15 years ago. And uh, him and his wife, are on, they, you know, they worked through it. They worked through the pain. They got counseling, and they, they stuck with it. And now, 15 years later, you know what he does? He hangs out with couples who struggle with affairs because many times God allows us to go through. He doesn't cause, but he allows us to go through some of these tumultuous times, these dangerous places we run to when we run from God so that we can help other people who are running from God. So it's my prayer that you would go and click on that Share Your Jonah story. It's anonymous, but we would love to be able to hear your story and we'd love to be able to share those with other people so that they can be able to say, you know what, I did and it didn't work out well for me. Next week, our big idea for next week, because right now I've left you with not too much hope, and I know that. It's kind of a bummer.
Here's our big idea for next week. We can run from God, but we can't outrun God. Hear what I said? You can run from God, but you can't outrun God. And that's not a threat. It's a promise. That's a good thing. Romans chapter 8. What can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus? Nothing. Nothing. Let me pray with you. Dear God, I thank you so much for these men and women here. I thank you so much, Lord, for the gathering. And Lord, this fantastic, wonderful church, what it's meant in my life, what David and Paula continue to mean in my life, God, and just the huge impact they're having in this community, God. Lord, I pray, Lord, that as we walk through and down these paths, that many times when we cut you out, God, we, we always run to unstable places. I pray that we would have enough courage to be able to share our story with somebody that we would be able to go on there and click and share our, our running from God, our Jonah story, because all of us have one. And Lord, I pray that you would be able to get the glory, even when we were going left and you told us to go right, that you would get the glory and we would help other people who are wandering away. I think I'm, that, I'm thinking of that hymn right now, God, of uh, come thou fount of every blessing, prone to wander, Lord, I leave, uh, prone to leave the God I love. And Lord, that's our story that we just, we just wander from you, Jesus. I pray that you would use our wanderings for your glory. I pray that all of us, Lord, that we would realize that it's not just about the people who are in, but you care for all people. We love you and we praise you and we thank you, Jesus. It's in your great big name that we pray. Amen. You're dismissed.